Hey everybody, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. For this episode, we got to speak with Richard Iyer. Richard's resume is much too long to share in its entirety, but he's had a remarkable career as an author, consultant, entrepreneur, and speaker. He's the author of more than 50 books, many written along with his wife, Linda. Richard and Linda are among America's most prominent voices on the subject of parenting, and together they wrote Teaching Your Children Values, which was the number one New York Times bestseller. They and their work have appeared on Oprah, the CBS Early Show, Today, Good Morning America, and many other national media outlets. Richard has also experienced wide-ranging church service, including serving as the president of the England-London South Mission, and he and Linda served as external advisors to the church on family. They are also the parents of nine children, and I'm sure Richard wouldn't mind us saying that he considers his family his greatest achievement. We got to speak with Richard about a variety of topics, including how we can contribute to society as a faith with a lot to offer, but whose members are relatively few in number, how we can make the difficult decisions that seem to have an outsized impact on our lives, and whether there's room for optimism as we engage the world around us. We want to extend a huge thanks to Richard for coming on and spending some time with us, and we hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Richard Iyer, thank you so much for joining us. We're really happy to have you here. Pleasure to be with you. You're the perfect ones to interview me. You're the age of my kids. I can lecture you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our listeners will have just heard an introduction to you. They will have heard a little bit about your professional background and, and um, the work and the experiences that you've had inside and outside of the church. But I would love to hear from you as you reflect back on your life. Um, and, and I hope that we're going to get a chance to really talk about finding our own meaningful work. And so right. I'd love for you to look back and and tell us which of those experiences seemed especially formative or, um, you know, which, which experiences really set a direction for your life and the work that you would pursue. I'll do that by telling you about a new book I'm writing that I have no idea where it'll go yet or even what the title is, but I'm thinking of calling it Aspiration. And that's a dirty word in the church, right? Yeah. Oh, don't aspire. That's, exactly. You know, you just have to wait to be called. But then we have this other thing that says be anxiously engaged without waiting to be called, mm -hmm. right? And we have four nations and we have patriarchal blessings. We've got all this stuff that causes us to feel somewhat anxious about whether we're doing what the Lord foreordained us to do. Right. And I think it leads to a whole mentality in the church of, of a little anxiety and, and a lot, sometimes a lot of guilt. I think parents in the church are the, we, we speak all the time to parents all around the world. Mormon LDS parents are, are the most guilt ridden. And I, really? I've, I've thought, really? why, why is that? And I think it's because our expectations are so much higher. Mm -hmm. You know, we want this perfect family. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you my real quick, my story about guilt. We were, Linda and I were traveling and we were up driving around up in Idaho. And it was Sunday, we, we went to this little ward. No one knew who we were, we didn't know anyone. Very rural. And we we're sitting there in the Sunday school class, which happened to be on parenting. <laughs> and we thought, we'll just sit here and say nothing and just, this will be interesting. And uh, unfortunately, it was very rural, but there was one other visitor there and you could tell, cause he was dressed like a city slicker and, <laughs> and the other people were dressed like farmers. But, but as the lesson went on, very humble woman teaching it, this guy had all the answers. He was, well, my son, well, how, how we did it, well, my daughter, the valedictorian, and my son, the mm. student body president, and I mean, everything, you know, he had it all. And it just got to be really too much. And uh, a beautiful thing happened. Class is nearly over, and a guy raises his hand, farmer guy, you could tell. And you could tell he was kind of nervous, but he raised his hand got called on, stood up, turned around, squared up against this bragger. And I'll <laughs> never forget what he said. He said, <clears throat> excuse me, sir, but God must have not thought much of you as a parent, sending you all them easy kids. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I squoze Linda's hand and I said, amen. <laughs> because that's how we are. We we think, we we judge ourselves on everything. Yeah. Oh, my child is a problem. I must be a bad mom. Or, Oh, I didn't, I, if I'd only done this, if I'd only seen this coming. And we just get so, so much angst about it, forgetting that these children are all ready themselves before they come, right. Right? right? And so one of the things I've thought about in terms of what he said was, you could turn it around. If you have a really tough kid, a really, it's driving you crazy and, and have, has big problems. You could say to yourself, God must have thought quite a bit of you as a parent, sending mm -hmm. you that mm -hmm. difficult child. So my point is, 
we aspire, and I think I, I think I'm coming to the conclusion it's a good thing to aspire. And just real quickly, I'll tell you to answer your question. Um, mm. I I have always aspired probably too much, and my aspirations have been misplaced a little bit. I was on a mission in New York City and was around people I thought were successful, and I thought I've got to go to Harvard Business School. Um, actually, I wanted to go to Harvard Law School. And I want to go into politics and I want to make a contribution. And George Romney, who I was working for a couple of years later in his presidential campaign, said, Richard, if you're really going into politics, go to business school instead. We got enough lawyers in politics. <laughs> we need more administrators. And that changed my course a little bit. And, and I'll make a long story short. We set it up. We strategically worked it out that we were going to have an opportunity for me to run for Congress after a political consulting firm that I founded got Jake Garn elected in Utah. And we were ready to go. And that was my aspiration. And I thought I'd prayed about it. And I, I guess it's because I'd prayed about it that the Lord intervened a little bit. And we got called to be a mission president mm -hmm. in London six months before the campaign and it oh, wow. changed the whole trajectory of our lives we began to realize that what really mattered wasn't and again you got to be careful not to generalize because for someone that might have been the right choice mm -hmm. it wasn't for us and we learned that every missionary we had you could trace his problems and his good qualities back to his family and after three years we came home convinced that our cause it's another word we use a lot in the church. You know, what's your cause? Yeah. You gotta have a cause, be anxiously engaged. And we decided our cause was gonna be families. So we started writing books and we started speaking and we started Joy School, which you know about, yes. and uh, some other interesting things. And I guess what I'm trying to say is aspiration is good as long as it is guided, right? And, 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 and as long as you have enough faith that if you're on the wrong tack a little bit, something will happen to turn you to the right mm. one as long as you're yeah. being prayerful about it. Yeah. I think we all go through that. I'll bet you I bet you two we, went through that. We definitely have. I mean, for me, there was a big decision point um, at, the end of, at the end of grad school, whether I was going to, and in my case, this is a professional question, whether I was going to go and work for a bigger company or, or whether sure. I was going to take a entre sure. more entrepreneurial path. Yeah. And... You know, it's interesting. I'm curious on what your thoughts are on on things like this, because I think like your your um, your example being called as a mission president. I mean, that's one where it's very clear. Well, it just it just happened. You like, love it's it an when intervention. that happens. Right. It's, it's an, an intervention. intervention. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what we long for. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Just give me an intervention. Yeah. I don't want to have to figure it out. Yeah. Right. And I think for a lot of people in their in their own personal decision points, it's a lot more ambiguous. Right. Yeah, like for sure it was it was for me in that case. And and as members of the church, like you said, I think we can be very overwhelmed because we expect ourselves uh, to be the best in our families, to be the best in our careers, to be the best in church, to be, contribute right. the most to the world. Right. And like, that's a lot. Um, in the absence of extremely clear spiritual direction, like the kind you got, or it's like an overwhelming feeling, which I never, I never got, you know, in, in this instance yeah. that I'm talking about, how do you, how do you make those types of You know, of that's a great question, Tim. I, in fact, that's one I wish if I had, uh, if you were to ask my kids, what has your dad tried hardest to teach you? I think it might be that question. And uh, here's how I learned it. We draw on our personal experience, right? Picture me now coming back from my mission in New York, falling in love with one Linda Jacobson, knowing I loved her, knowing that I would never find anyone better, but being scared half to death. Again, the anxiety. Marriage is a bigger decision for us than other people. We're talking about time and eternity. That's a good point. We're yeah. talking about this little mortality where we make all these decisions that determine the rest of everything. Right. And I, I was just frozen with fear, you know. And and I, I knew what I thought was right. But again, same thing. How do you know? How do you know? And I did a foolish thing. But I love telling this story. Um, uh, President Lee he was not yet the prophet, but he was elderly, a member of the Twelve, had been to our mission, and I had driven him around. So I, And I remembered, just flashed in my mind that night while I was laying there with all this angst, that he had said, 
Elder Iyer, if you ever need anything, just come and see me. I'm sure he said that to every yeah. missionary he ever met. I got in my car at 6 a.m. in Logan and drove to Salt Lake thinking, I'm, I, boy, if anyone ever needed help. And I got there before the church administration building opened. And when it opened, I went in and I found his office. That's and his secretary looked at me like I was <laughs> from Mars. And, and, and I said, I need to see Elder Lee. And she said, so do a lot of people. <laughs> Did you get an appointment? No, no, but I really need it. I think she thought I was suicidal because she went in his office and came out and said, he's waiting for his first wow. appointment. If you wow. go right in. You, well, long story short, I went in and, and he had a little, he could tell. I mean, this lovesick wow. kid. And I said, he said, what can I help you? And he said, Elder Iyer. And I'm like, he knows me. Oh, wow. And then I, but I realized she had come. Oh. <laughs> and I liked the story before he said that for a bit. Yeah. The spirit. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, I need to know if I should get married. Well, easy, you should. No, no, I mean, it's this certain girl. And it went on like that for a while. He said things like, can she bake a cherry pie? I mean, he was oh, just, my he was God. loving. I was his comic <laughs> relief. A different, for different time. Yeah, but yeah. then he got very serious. And this is the answer to your question, I think, Tim. He took his big scriptures and, and he opened it to, to a scripture. And he I still remember this so vividly. He turned it around, slid it across to me, and he said, read section nine. And I remember, again, how foolish and young I was. I remember I'd read section nine before, but this is the Apostles edition. Maybe there's something. <laughs> right. And I started reading, and it got to that part that says, if it is right... I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you and you shall know that it is right. And if it is not right, you will have a stupor of thought. And I thought, if what, I, I said, so he said to me, have you done that? And I said, well, if what is right, if Linda's right? And he said, no, no, here's what you have to understand. You have to make the decision. You can't. He gave me this mm. wonderful one-minute lesson on agency. You don't ask the Lord to decide for you. You don't even ask the Lord to push you in the direct. You you ask for clarity and you guidance and the Spirit to mm. make your own decision, but yeah. you don't act on it until you get that confirmation. And it had a kind of a neat ending to the story after after I understood that. He came around. Certain things are vivid, right, forever. This is a long time ago put his arm around me and said, Elder Iyer, we don't usually advise people to fast for more than 24 hours, but you're a strapping lad. <laughs> fast for two days and take, he said, you've made your decision. That's obvious to me. Take mm -hmm. it to God and you will wow. know. And I, I mean, what happened is too spiritual to talk about, but I knew. And I think, I think that's what we have to do. I think if I had done that with politics, the Lord might not have had to call me on a mission to get me off that path. I don't know. Yeah. But I think we can, we have that access, you know? Yeah. And, and we also have to not be so afraid of making a wrong choice now and then because it all works out. Yeah. That was more, that was closer to, so my experience was sort of, sort of the opposite. In fact, I had one of those same meetings with a, but just with a bishop when we were deciding if we should get married. Interesting. <laughs> and, and I wanted him to say, yes, you should. And the spirit, you know, don't yeah. you recognize the voice? And and the scripture that he read to me actually was about being anxiously engaged. Interesting. And, and that is what I Literally, needed because... Anxiously engaged. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. be anxious about being engaged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but that, that actually <laughs> really did speak to my heart because I think I was so anxious that it was difficult to recognize the spirit at that time. Like yeah. I was so so worried about making yeah. this decision oh, yeah. that the that that was really nice advice that was good advice for me that just you keep moving and trust that that a new way will come up or that right. your energy will shift and you'll you'll want something different and yeah. and that gave me confidence to just keep moving forward yeah that and, whole thing of keeping moving yes yeah. and that's what i feel like i kept recognizing in your story that you were you were you had aspirations and you were moving, like you were really moving all the time. Yeah. And then you were flexible, you know, and new things would come into your path. And then you recognize that as your new path, as, oppo as opposed to just right. these constant like stops and starts and stops and starts and waiting for direction. Because I, for me, that has always been an immobilizing way 
to make decisions. I, I have to just like keep, keep going. On going. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the, again, the lesson of agency and why we're here, right? Yeah. To just keep on moving. Another thing I'm thinking of maybe calling the book is, is, um, being in the world but not of the world because that mm. was really that was really my problem at that point is i was uh, not not with mary and linda that's that's the best decision i've ever made but in a way that in a re, that that's a binary decision do i do do i marry her or not you know right. and you can you can deal but what do i do with my life where's my path what's my coordination is this about the ward or about the world? Should I focus my my attention on church service or should I focus it on world service? Um, I remember one talk we had, I, I haven't thought of this for years, Tim, but at the business school, maybe you had similar hmm. talks. Group of us gathered around, what are you gonna do? I mean, we're getting close to graduation. How many job offers do you have? How many interviews have you had? Yeah. How much do you think you could make the first year? You know, what are the offers? We had this one guy there who said, who shocked us all. He said, I've decided I'm going to go to work for church education coming out of the Harvard Business School. And we're like, what? And he said, I've decided the my concern is I don't want to earn more. I, I'm putting a ceiling rather than a floor on my, and I want to do, I want to be anxiously engaged in the Lord's work every day. Something about that just set us all back. And we're like, are we going the wrong way here? Mm. Where's our choice going to be? And it's just such a deal to think about in the world and not of the world and what that means. I know you've got some ideas what it means. Yeah, well, I wanted you to talk about this because you're the first person I've ever heard talk about being in the world as its own directive. Yeah. Like we, we like to focus on not being of the world and and how that should look in our life. And we're, we, you know, we're really good at that as Latter-day Saints. Yeah, we sure Getting are. out of the world. Yeah, yeah but I, I love how you recognize being in the world as its, as its very own injunction. And, and so, yeah, can you talk about that for a minute? What do you think being in the world should look like? Don't you, don't you think it gets to the whole question of inclusive and exclusive and everything like that and how uh, we tend to get so caught up with our own importance in the world. I mean, we're, we're 15 million people, right? If you take active members, we're maybe seven. Yeah. There's seven billion people. We're, we're one in a thousand. Yeah. Seven billion <laughs> yep. versus That's seven That's an easier million. way to and, and like how, comprehend that. And, and how could we possibly believe in a God who's far more interested in those seven million than in the other seven billion? And, and so our, our writing has illustrated that whole point. We, our first books were written for the church, for Deseret Book and for Bookcraft. And then we just kept feeling like we're preaching to the choir. We're in an echo chamber here. There's a lot of people that could write what we're writing to the same people we're writing it to. What if we could get it further out? And we actually, you know, it was an interesting time in life because Deseret was thinking they needed a national imprint. Mm. And they started Shadow Mountain for, for two of our books, Teaching Children Joy. <laughs> yes, Joy School, our favorite. And yes. Teaching Children <laughs> Responsibility. And... Uh, you know, we went on a book tour with those two books by Shadow Mountain, and we're in San Francisco doing a, a morning show called Good Morning San Francisco. We get back to the hotel, and this is an example of being guided, right? And the phone rings, and it's the president of Random House, a woman who was in San Francisco on business, happened to turn the TV oh, wow. on, saw it, said, we want to buy your books. Oh, wow. I wow. said, well, we don't own them. You'll have to call Deseret Books. She did, and she bought them. And suddenly this thing we'd been praying about, right? Like, should we continue to write to the church or should we write to more to the world? And that was the answer. And and they bought those books and that changed the whole trajectory. But again, the, the question is, uh, it has to be two admonitions, I think. Mm. I, I'm sure it can be used in many ways, but be in the world. How are you going to be the leaven in the loaf or the yeast or the catalyst. Don't you love those words? I mean, that suggests yeah. that a little thing, you know, we're stewards over this incredible restoration that we have. And if we can put ourselves in a position where it catalyzes other people, and then there's a ring of truth to it. Stephen Covey right. learned that. You know, a lot of people don't know. Stephen would write a book as though it were to the church a lot of times, and then he'd rephrase it, getting rid of church terminology and guess what it works wow. just as well in the wow. world because truth is truth 
and people recognize, and especially in parenting and so on. So we, but again, is that the right decision for everyone? No, some people would get an answer, focus like this guy that was gonna teach seminary, right? right? That's great, that's your answer. But we ought to consider that it's a big world out there and they all need what we have if we can think of a way to deliver it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like sometimes maybe some of our reading of reading of scripture or interpretation, cultural potentially interpretation of doctrine leads us to a more insular worldview. Like when we yeah. hear when we hear the terms and repeat the terms over and over, st stuff like only, you know, only oh, true and living oh. church, mm. in which I think, you know, as a phrase, it has some value, but it can it can imply there's not a whole lot going on outside of exactly. of what we have, and so why why reach out? How do you how do you deal with well, that? Well, I mean, I loved your interview with a good friend of ours, Michael Wilcox, and yeah. why not have four standard works from the West and yeah. four from the East, right? Because there's wonderful wonderful things that are said there, and uh, yeah, I just think we need to understand that there's a lot out there that we don't know, and that we. I, w I wish our missionaries could be more like that. You know, if 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 the missionary attitude was, I sure want to learn from you, but I also want to teach you some things. You know, mm -hmm. the thing that Linda, if Linda was here, she would tell you that what used to annoy her the most. We were in London, of course, and missionaries occasionally she'd hear one say, "Can you believe this cathedral? This is, you know, look how cold it is in here. This is Oof. not right." You know, yeah. oh, Linda would come down on them like, yeah. People gave their lives over centuries. This is an edifice to God. You need to respect it, mm -hmm. you know. And, and just that idea of being open to, I mean, Joseph was the best one to teach it, right? Yeah. We yeah. seek truth everywhere. Yeah. And, and that's, I think that's what Faith Matters is doing. You're trying to, but let's go back to what you said for a minute, Tim, about the only true church. I, yeah. Let me ask you a question, and then I think it'll tie into what we're just on. <laughs> Some in the church like to minimize the fact that there's always been faith crisis and so on. But, mm -hmm. but you and I know that there's more now and it's deeper in a lot of ways than it's ever been. And a lot of it's among people of your generation. I think the most serious part is among 30 and 40 something. I, kids have got time to sort it out and figure it out. But when you see people who are in the prime of their life and the prime of their families leaving and, and feeling like they don't have a home anymore, why, why can you, I mean, you've thought about that a lot and so have I, but yeah. do you think there's a purvey, can you find a common thread that's I, always there? I think I we'd probably some, say the I same have thing. Some thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you want to go first? Oh, I think I'll say what you'll say, but yeah, I'll try. I, 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 something that we talk about a lot is that what seems to consistently be really problematic is when we, um, like what Brian McLaren says, when, when we try to consistently express faith as correct beliefs, people have problems for, yeah, for like right. a number of reasons. When faith right. is expressed as love, right. when, we, when we're focusing on like pure I religion, that, yeah. everybody, it works. It and it's it so together. edifying yeah. and so connecting that there's nothing to criticize. It's something that you want to be a part of. But I think, I think we tend to be a little bit insular, like you were saying, and exclusivist, and that is becoming more and more distasteful yeah. and yeah. unproductive. Yeah. I, I, that that's, exa that's, that's, really, exactly that's exactly what right. I was going to say. And I think, I think the <clears throat> part of the problem is with the, with the really direct focus on correct beliefs that we have, at least at least cultural or on correct beliefs culturally, um, we also set up a sort of a domino effect where we like mm. we talk about how you know if and this is in some cases been explicit that you know if one if one piece of your correct belief puzzle you know falls apart right. then everything else exactly. goes goes with it. It's like a domino. It's effect. a it's a domino yeah. effect, and and I think that like. <clears throat> With modern technology and the internet, there are you know there are legitimate challenges to any number of Absolutely. any number of beliefs, yeah. and so if like one of those really for whatever reason resonates with someone, then everything needs to go yeah. because I feel like that's the way we've sort of we've sort of set it up. But like Aubrey said, if our faith could express itself more in more in love and in service than in correct beliefs, there's really no dominoes to fall. That's exact. Boy, I couldn't agree with you more. I, and let me say it in uh, maybe another way because you said you know. The only true church, please, let's get rid of that. Uh, and there, but there's other even more innocuous, innocent things. Like I, 
I will visit a ward and sweet little child gets up, right? And how do they start their testimony? I'd like to bear my testimony and I know the church is true. Well, <laughs> it is really cute. <laughs> it is really cute, but they don't know. And no is right. the wrong word. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and other kids are sitting there saying, I don't know. And it, right. it starts that early, right? And, and if they would say, I believe, or I feel, I love Jesus, I love, Jesus, I love my family, then I think we'd be on safe ground. Let, let me try this on you. I think I, oh, the people I've talked to who I think, and, and by the way, let me just say, uh, one of our daughters, I told you what made Linda mad. I'll tell you what makes this <laughs> daughter mad. She was in a group and they were saying, oh, there's so many faith crises in the church. We see it everywhere. Someone in that group said, well, if you look a little closer, it's because of some commandment they're breaking. Yeah. Mm. And Sadie just went off on this person. Yeah. She said, wait a second. Let me tell you my experience. The people who I'm worried about who are leaving are the most, they're the most thoughtful, deep people I know. The ones who are staying in are the ones who aren't thinking very. And I mean, she was going, <laughs> she said, I, I don't want you telling me that these people are having a faith crisis. Mm. It, it, nothing to do. It's, it's because they're thinking hard. Mm. And, and I got thinking about that, even the, this another word we use, it's kind of an interesting word, active. We want, all parents want their kids to be active. Right. I'm not sure we use the word right. I think active might mean you're thinking hard, you're mm. doubting, you're, mm. you're questioning, you're active. Yeah, well, what a good point. Whereas a person who's not, a, who's a clone, is just showing up and- you What know, an oh, interesting you're, point. You're yeah. active, yeah. you know? Like there are cases where people who are leaving and becoming active. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really true. But here's yeah. what I wanted to try on you. I think we put too much pressure on the gospel and, 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 and on, on the church and when it's a little imperfect, that's where we start to be shaky. Um, I I like to, I think a paradigm shifts are interesting. And here's a paradigm shift I think works for a lot of people. The church is not the end. If, if the church is the goal or the end or the thing we're all going to, an activity in the church is, is the goal, mm -hmm. I think we're missing the point. But if, if we think of the church as the means yeah. to the end, it's one of the things that helps us get where we want to get. Where do we want to get? Well, the scriptures tell us we want exaltation. That's the ultimate thing we want. Which, by the way, exaltation is the church's word. Did you know this? If you Google exaltation, all the references are LDS. Oh, I did not really? know that. That's our word. That's very did interesting. Not know if, you, that. if you Google salvation, oh, you'll get a million yeah. things. Wow. And, and somewhere in there, you'll get salvation in the LDS terminology is interesting because it's not just one thing, it's three kingdoms and all that. Right. But but when you Google exaltation, that's our word. Interesting. And, and it has to do with eternal families. It has to do with eternal, not only life, but eternal lives. And all the rest that we that we know, we don't understand, mm -hmm. we can't comprehend it, but we know it's there. And if we start thinking of that as the end, and then and then you get concerns, right? Wait, half the church is single. Half the we can't talk about marriage. We can't. Well, of course we can, because the other beauty of the gospel is it's a long runway, right? Mm. And we know there's a spirit world. We know there's a millennium, and it, it goes on and on. But if we if we say the church is and, and this bothers people, but I'm I'm really committed to it in my own mind. Christ is the means. Mm -hmm. Christ is not the end. I think it, it demeans Christ to think of him as the end. He is the means whereby we get to the end. And and what I'm trying to say, I'm probably doing it a little clumsily, but. But when the church is the means, of course it's not perfect. It's run by men. It's, people have opinion. It should be run more by women, but they have opinion too. And, and you're always going to have things, and you're going to have historical things, and mm -hmm. you're going to have worries about what someone said and why he said it. But that's not important. What's important is, does it help you? Does it, is it a means to get you to be a better person? Does it help you with your family? I mean, we've got all right. these things, right? I mean, starting with President McKay, no other success compensates for failure in the home. President Lee, the most important work you'll ever do will be in the walls. Now, President Nelson, church, family-centered, church-supported. Right. Here's, here's, a, here's a couple of great ones. Maybe you haven't heard. President Oaks, this is my new favorite one. Our, it's two Again, it's two brief sentences. It's kind of like the other one we were talking about. Yeah. Um, 
our theology begins with heavenly parents, period. Mm -hmm. Our highest aspiration, there's my word, see, mm -hmm. it's, our highest aspiration is to be like them. Well, that's the goal. That's the end. That's the, that's where we're going. The church is, and the Savior, and the atonement, and our own brains, and our own friends, and these are all, some are far more important means than others, but yeah. they're means. And then I think you can relax a little. Yeah. You know, right. There's so much less angst in thinking yeah. that right. way. I, think, that, yeah. I, I was just gonna say, I think that helps explain this sort of like 0.1% problem. Like yeah. we're so like we're so small within everything else, but it, and it's hard to say, okay, the church is the end and we're just this tiny, tiny yeah. fraction. But if yeah. you think of it as a means, then that opens up and says, okay, that's this is our way. This is our way of connecting right. to our right. eternal potential. And like Brother Wilcox was, was bringing up, there are lots of other means, yeah. you know, and I, th I think eventually they'll all coincide in, in some way. Or Patrick Mason, you know, yeah. we, we're, we're really good at growing this part, this crop, mm -hmm. but Buddhists are way better at the meditation crop right. than we are and so on. And yeah. I just, I love that. I love yeah. that way of thinking. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be incredibly grateful for what we do have, which is, I wish, I wish I could think of just the right way to say that. So it's not, we're the only true church, but it's, yeah, but we have wow, we that have are, some yeah. extra truth that's really pretty great. Yeah, you know? it's unique to us. It's unique to us and that we could pass on and that gives scope and perspective, especially, you know, Terrell would say, right, it's the pre-mortal life. That's what you need to know about. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the parental God. I mean, if you if you were to say how how, unique and how valuable is our theology, you wouldn't have to go any further, right? We know we know there's a parental God, a heavenly mother and heavenly father. We know we lived with them before we came here. Now everything else in the gospel becomes sort of natural. Well, of course they'd have a plan for us. Of course we once lived with them. Of course they care about all of us equally. Yeah. I mean, all the rest of the theology becomes sort of... Of course they want us to become like them. Of course yeah. they do. Every yeah. parent does, yeah. you know? And so that's that's where I wish we could go more yeah. and more. And I think we are going that direction. Yeah. I think the other part that is so healthy about that paradigm is that instead of constantly asking yourself if this feels like, it, you know, if the truth feels like it is always in perfect alignment and is there anything problematic here? You know, that that is a hard thing to always be wrestling with. But right. But this paradigm where the church is the means really opens up this space for the idea that church is meant to be hard. There are supposed to be problematic things that you feel resistant to. Right. And that That's in itself yeah. is bringing you closer to God. Like why we we just had a conversation with Patrick Mason and and um, David Pulsifer about their their peace book. And and we're talking about violence in the Book of Mormon. And, and it just feels like even the fact that we're feeling troubled by this idea that there is violence <clears throat> from God in the Book of Mormon, the fact that we have to wrestle with that says something about how we feel about God. And, yeah. and that conversation in itself, I think, is helping us to draw. I love that. To become closer to, to God. So I so this mean like church as a means works for me on every level. Well, and Patrick also his metaphor of the fortress church, right? I mean, yes. yeah, yeah. The last thing you'd ever want to be. And, and and I was talking to a non-member, uh, that's a terrible term too, by the way. <laughs> I was talking to a man not of our faith who, who was complaining about the temples and uh, why are they so secret? They're so exclusive, only you guys can go there. I thought, oh man, if we could just somehow help ourselves and others to understand the temple's the most inclusive place in the world. We want everyone, we want, you know, before, after, and now, we want to be that inclusive. We want to reach out. And I think we're getting there. I think, and I love, I'm going back to the yeast and the, the leaven. I, I remember a, time, a few years ago, it was stylish to say, oh, the church is exploding in its growth. Right. right. <laughs> Project it out, you know, and they, they're even quoting people, it'll be the new yeah. world mm -hmm. religion. Cover of Time Magazine, yeah. world's fastest yeah. growing religion, or America's oh, fastest. Yeah. Gosh. That, I mean, yeah. Let's be realistic, right? It's we're always going to be small, but if we're that catalyst, mm -hmm. so powerful. Um, yeah, yeah. What are some in your mind? We, I think, and Patrick talked with the Fortress Church. He yeah. talks about how it's sort of been out of our history of persecution and and fear that we sort of we've pulled up the drawbridge and closed yeah. the windows and. Uh, you know, we I think we're lucky enough now in 2021 to live in a to live in a world where we're not 
actively persecuted, at least in the form of physical violence. No. And so what are, in your mind... In fact, it's probably been an advantage to us. I, I think it was an advantage to me in interviewing out of, out oh, of interesting! Business really? Oh, yeah. you're an LDS. Oh, that that's yeah. really interesting. You know, yeah. unique. Yeah, just the opposite in a way. But yeah, go ahead. So, in in your mind, now that we're no longer in that in that world of 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 persecution, it, it, I guess a is it time to like let down the drawbridge and b like what are real, actually practical ways that we can start to do that? Well, I that's a great question, Tim. I think the most practical way is just what we were talking about earlier that the family is. You know, uh, here's an here's another one by Elder Lee that I've always quoted, and I wish we'd quote it more in the church. Um, this is really powerful. The imagery of it. He said, "The church is the scaffolding mm. with which we build eternal families." Think about that. I mean, a lot of people do. Wait a minute. I'm not calling the church. I mean, you think of bamboo and scaffolding and temporary stuff. That's exactly what he meant. The church is just for this earth, won't exist afterwards. It'll be the family that's there. I think if we if we could start getting to there, that's what that's what opens it up. You know, we're Linda and I speak all the time to two groups I'm thinking of, particularly YPO, you probably know Young Presidents yeah. and, and Entrepreneurs Association. These are people roughly your age. Highly to join, you have to be the head of a company that has X earnings by the time you're 40. Mm -hmm. So powerful people. And, and what I keep finding is that they, people who, even when, even when their thought process is not a spiritual one, even when it's purely practical, what's the best way to live? What's the happiest way to live? I think it's commitment. I think it's married with children. They're mm -hmm. coming to that conclusion without any help from religion. What we ought to be doing is saying, you're absolutely right. And, and by the way, if you're not there, we'd like to get you there because that's what matters. And guess what? We, we can help you. We can help yeah. you practically. You know, I, I'd love to see 19-year-old missionaries. They're not experts on family, but they're a product of a society that has a divorce rate about one fourth of the national average, if you just take temple marriage, right? Wow. And has a college graduation rate. This is what people want. We have what people want. And if we could offer, I could see two missionaries say, let's show you how to have a family home evening. Let's show you how to trace your genealogy. That's really fun. It help your family, you'll be more resilient. And these practical things, and they're getting indoors now they couldn't even approach before. They're talking to a level of people that wouldn't be interested otherwise, and think how close they are then to what they want to say theologically. Mm. If you ever wondered why we're so family oriented, <laughs> let me quote President Oaks, our theology begins with heavenly parents. Now you're into the plan of salvation. Now you're into the preexistence. Yeah. Now, you, I mean, to me, that's the way to teach the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me ask you, as, uh, as someone that has been involved in missionary work your entire life, yeah. um, is what what is, in your mind, the future of, of missionary work. I, oh, I, 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 I like I we do have, I um, we, I, 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 I'm speaking really from personal experience here and maybe I'm the only one that felt this, felt this way, but I, I took a little bit of a colonialist attitude with me on my mission. Yeah. It was all about what am I, it. what am I yeah. going to teach you? Yeah. You know? And, um, you're just waiting as, for him to shut up so you can teach. Right. You know, say exactly. The next thing. Oh, oh, cool. That's what you believe. <laughs> okay. Let me tell right. you what's actually true. Um, but I, I wonder about, uh, both in terms of efficacy just and in terms of uh morality and everything else like i love the idea of missionaries showing up at a on a front doorstep with you know trowels and buckets yeah. and whatever Me and saying too. and it, what's funny is that we even on even on my mission i imagine in many missions we said okay who's our best missionary example and it was always ammon yeah we talked about ammon absolutely but we, ne we didn't approach it like ammon <laughs> yeah. at all who showed up to lamoni yeah. and said how can i how can i serve you you know, so I don't know. What, what well, are your thoughts on this? A good friend of ours, Dennis Webb, who, who uh, he, he actually called it the Ammon model. He was in the oh, Southern oh, States wow, mission, okay. and that's what he did. His really? missionaries went out and served all okay, day. Okay, I just did his own so thing. Fascinating. It, was, it was amazing. It was amazing the yeah. results he had. It hasn't caught fire like I mm -hmm. thought it would in the church, but but I would. I mean, that's that's the other pillar: service and family. If those two yeah. things were the, 
I mean, what'd you learn at Harvard Business School? You look for self-perceived needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The hardest the exactly. hardest thing to do is to say, hey, we got this product that you really should want. I know you <laughs> exactly. don't want it yet, <laughs> exactly. but let me tell you about it and then maybe you'll start to want it. <laughs> yes. I mean, how much better to say, you know, we know your self-perceived needs the same as ours. You want to have a strong family that lasts. We might be able to help on that. Yeah. You know? And then, and, and by the way, do you need something? We had yeah. a sister, I have to tell you quickly, Sister Little, I still see her in my mind. She didn't have an Ammon model. That's just what she did. She just would knock on a door in England. Mm -hmm. No, we're not interested. Well, is there anything we could do for you? We really, and she'd yeah. mean it. And they would go in and clean that house. And wow. they would, you know, they'd keep their overalls in the car. And oh. uh, here's the end of the story. I love this story. One woman who would not let her in, not let her talk to anything, but they'd change the light in her foyer every couple of months because it would burn out, oh. and they knew about it, and they'd go back and do oh. it and do it and do it. End of the story is that when, as they were leaving, Sister Little went back one last time to change the light bulb one last time, and, and she said, I'm leaving, going home. And this, uh, this older lady said, well, there's something you should probably know. And, and she thought she was going to say, I, I want to l learn about the church. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, she said, my daughter is now a member of your church. Come to find out, she well, had written to her daughter, said the most Christ-like people I've ever known are these two sisters that come around. That daughter living in the States had found the missionaries and oh, wow. baptized. Wow. I mean, don't you love that? Yeah. yeah. Just what you said. It's all about love. That, yeah. That's what ought to be taught. And that it feels is. more connecting. Yeah. I'm not critical of the missionary system. I think it's adjusting. I think it's going to get better and better and better. And uh, love yeah. is going to be the key. Yeah. I love it. You brought up a few other ways that the church really um, is, you know, in like you said, it's scaffolding. Like it really does set you up in a lot of ways to be free of of problems that make your life mission harder to accomplish yeah, i think you know yeah. and and I'm not, I'm not sure i've really thought about that up. very much yeah yeah it just that. is a good it's a good recipe for having real agency you know and for really being able to focus on what's right. important to you right so but i wonder if just as we kind of wrap up if you would talk about what you think the real work of the restoration is now because i i imagine there are some listeners who are like I, you know i never figured out what my calling was like i don't know what is it to raise yeah, a family is yeah. it and so i i would love for you because you've been so involved in really meaningful work outside of the church and and inside of the church you know what do you think the restoration is calling us to do boy that's such a good it's such a deep question i, I don't know that i have a great answer other than i just think we have to constantly push ourselves to think bigger and think wider and I don't know that it'll come as a directive. I think it may mm. bubble up rather than trickle down. I think that's the beauty of it. Um, I think every parent has to ask all these questions we're asking. I mean, we I'll show you how far we went on the in the world and out of the world. We ended up for many years raising our children, living in Salt Lake and in Washington, D.C., partly because my business was both places. but. Our kids would go to school in Indian Hills on the east bench of Salt Lake, and you'd walk in their classroom and it looked like they were all brothers and sisters. They were wow. all from the same family. Yeah. And you'd go in their class in McLean, Virginia, and it looked like the United Nations. I mean, wow. And we thought, if we can just help our children to see that the world is good, the world is generally a great place, and there's so much need for things to be done, I mean, I, I was going to ask you earlier, but the time's probably passed whether whether you think the world's getting better or worse. <laughs> I What I find is if you ask that to people who are over 60 in the church, they'll usually say it's worse. It's going to hell really? in a handbasket. There's, look at the morality. Look at the, it's this world is. Really? And I, and I most of the time, I think with, uh, with younger generations, there's a little more optimism, and I love that, even though it's harder. And I think it's harder to raise children now than it's ever been before. But I think the restoration um, is intended to give us the answers. It's, it's the pieces to the puzzle that we're missing that we need to fit in in order to keep on going. And I think members of the church are going to excel in more and more areas, not only in the arts, but in business and in so many other ways and be catalysts mm. and not so much 
to get everyone to be baptized, but to get everyone to see the answers that we have and find their own way to apply them. That's beautiful. Well Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thanks so much for your wisdom, that. Richard. Hey, it's really good to be with you guys. And yeah. I'm looking forward to talking about a book I have done the next <laughs> time we talk. <laughs> that sounds great. I'm just working this one out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Appreciate it. Our pl- right. My pleasure. Thanks again for listening, and we really hope you enjoyed this conversation with Richard Dyer. A huge thanks again to Richard for coming on. And as always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we'd love for you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. It definitely helps get the word out about Faith Matters, and we really appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening, and as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.